Hello and welcome to Rebel Heroines, a podcast celebrating the rebel heroines of the Greek myths and the women who write about them through original audio drama, poetry, book and theatre reviews and interviews with fellow fans and authors. This episode is a bit of a change of schedule to what I had planned as I've had some microphone difficulties but that's getting sorted so usual sound quality will be resumed. So I've just finished reading Natalie Haynes's latest non-fiction Greek mythology book Divine Might about the goddesses of ancient Greece, and naturally I'm loving it because she's awesome, and her collected works were a big inspiration for this podcast. It's great because you get just the right amount of history, just the right amount of picking apart historical patriarchy, just the right amount of Natalie being hilarious. It was nice to learn about the muses and the furies as well as the goddesses of the pantheon, Did you know there was an Athena Barbie doll and she's got a laurel crown and an owl accessory and everything? At this point, I usually poke a bit of fun at the men of Greek mythology before we get stuck into the heroine goodness. But this episode, I'm doing something a bit different. I thought it was about time I tipped the balance and talked a bit about the titans, gods and heroes I actually like and have time for who aren't complete git stacks and actually do some good. Let's get stuck in, shall we? First off, I want to big up the big guy, Atlas, the titan who carries the world on his shoulders, or rather holds the heavens up so Gaia and Uranus can't make any more titans. Clever plan. I bet it wasn't Zeus's idea, though. I bet it was one of the goddesses. Why is Atlas the instrument for the big earth and sky sex ban? because Atlas leads the rebellion against those upstart new gods. Of course, the Titans lose the rebellion, and Atlas is punished with literally holding up the heavens. But what I like about Atlas is that at any time, he could just throw that weight off and say, screw you guys. Why doesn't he? I like to think it's because he has some sympathy for all the mortals he might squish and that he has insight about how more new titans would mean more endless war. What would happen if he just set his weight down? This is the theme of a great novel about Atlas, Weight by Jeanette Winterson, and in it, After holding up this weight for centuries, Atlas lets himself contemplate what might happen if he just lets it all go. It's a beautiful, haunting novel, using his ordeal as a metaphor for the weight we all carry needlessly. Before his rebellion, Atlas had a bunch of titan wives, a couple of kids, among them the guardians of the golden apples. He had a brief respite from his punishment when Hercules used this family link to trick Atlas into getting those apples from his daughters for one of his labours. But Hercules manages to get Atlas to take the weight back, the tricksy devil. More of him later. Atlas has a tragic end when Perseus, yeah, that dickhead again, begs him for hospitality, but fearing another trick, Atlas refuses. Because when you've been duped by one Greek hero, you've pretty much met them all and you know what's coming. So naturally, Perseus turns him to stone with the head of Medusa, that innocent girl he decapitated. And Atlas becomes the Atlas Mountains, which I've been to, actually, in Morocco, and they're beautiful. Remember those Greek myth oracle cards I talked about in the Titanesses episode, the ones made by Carissa Milado? Well, Atlas's message is all about responsibility. You have a responsibility to give yourself a balanced life. It's not your responsibility to carry the burdens of others. Good advice. 
But Atlas essentially does carry the weight for his fellow Titans. The rest of them are banged up in Tartarus, not having a great time, it's true. But his punishment is particularly cruel because his punishment literally keeps his conquerors in power, which incidentally leads to them being able to screw up mortals. So whether or not he's being altruistic, there wouldn't really be much Greek mythology to geek out about without him. So thanks, Atlas. Let's have a shout out to Atlas's brother Prometheus, who gave us mortals the gift of fire so we could have a less miserable time. And why were we created in the first place? Well, wasn't for any noble cause really. It was because Zeus was bored and wanted things to play with and destroy minions to adore him and so forth. And Prometheus's punishment for making sure, you know, we didn't get frostbite and all that, was for him to have his liver pecked out by an eagle, only to have it grow back and be pecked out again forever. Zeus is just the ultimate shitbag, isn't he? I mean, he gets someone smarter than him to invent toys for him and then he punishes their creator, who, by the way, taught mortals all the knowledge, like all the stuff they need to know, like how to toast marshmallows over the campfire and all that, and for giving us the means to stay alive and thrive so the gods can keep screwing with us and feeding off our worship. Zeus should have thanked Prometheus for ensuring our longevity, really. It's worth mentioning that Prometheus and his brother were spared Tartarus, unlike most of the rest of the Titans, because they sided with Zeus. But I'm pretty sure Prometheus had plenty of time, chained to his rock, to think about how things might have gone down if he'd stuck with his family. What would the landscape of Greek mythology be like if the Titans had won the war? Prometheus wasn't afraid to piss Zeus off. He managed to trick him into accepting the nasty bits of animal sacrifices to the gods, so we got the good bits. And he could also see into the future and refuse to tell Zeus which of his children would overthrow him. So he's on our side, which is commendable, but he really doesn't get any let up in his punishment for that until... And this is where another decent chap from Greek mythology comes in. The centaur Chiron gives up his immortality in exchange for Prometheus's freedom. Chiron, especially when I conjure up Chiron as Jason Momoa in my head, isn't like the other centaurs, who are basically drunken, rapey horse bastards. Because Chiron has an incurable wound given to him by Hercules, which was an accident, but his wound doesn't heal and it makes him a great healer and a great teacher. As well as teaching Hercules everything he knows, he also taught other heroes like Jason, Achilles, Perseus, Theseus, all my favourite dickheads, And I do wonder, what exactly did he teach them, considering they all turned out to be varying degrees of arsehole? But to give him the benefit of the doubt, I can imagine he did his best with them when they were young and stupid. And maybe some of it sunk in, but no doubt, as soon as they got it into their heads that they needed to exert their authority, all his wisdom went out the window. It's like, Guys, did all that meditation and ayahuasca and all those yoga with Adrian YouTube videos we did together mean nothing? I'm disappointed. Poor Chiron, man. What a waste of his talent. It's a shame no one sent their promising daughters to him so he could pass on some knowledge to the women who would have to navigate these Muppets. Chiron's oracle message is healing. The greatest gifts we impart to the world come from our greatest wounds. Mmm, wisdom. There's a lot in astrology about Chiron's symbology as the wounded healer. We've all got to take responsibility for our wounds at some point and decide whether we thrive with them or just survive in spite of them. And that's a bit of spiritual wisdom from me there. You're welcome. 
Chiron's wound can't heal because he's immortal, but in giving up his immortality, it means that Prometheus can go free and Chiron can hang out on Olympus without being a killjoy who's always moaning about his gammy leg. And this plan was actually Hercules' idea. I know, big, brawny, somewhat dense Hercules did have a bit of wisdom in him too. I've actually got time for Hercules. I know he has some problematic moments in his mythology, but at least some of his labours actually benefit people other than him. It's not just about going on some dumb quest because some guy who wants to shag your mum wants you out of the way because you're at that annoying, simpering brat stage and you're killing his seduction vibes with all your death staring. The fact that his labours are an atonement for the killing of his family because Hera full-on detests him and drives him mad means he's making up for something he didn't technically do of his own volition. His killing of hydras and lions is helpful to the communities under threat. He's a champion of the people and he humbles himself to serve the whims of a man who sends him off to do some pretty dangerous and degrading things when he could just say, fuck y'all, I'm doing my own thing. It's not my fault I killed my wife. It was that bitch Hera. Laters. Maybe he's only doing it all so in the end he can just go up to Olympus and shack up with a goddess. Oh, bless little Hebe. I hold the cups. I just love cups. But you know what? He shoveled a lot of shit in those stables. You don't see Perseus or Theseus getting their shiny armour covered in horse shit, do you? Nuff said. I'm looking forward to reading Herc by Phoenicia Rogerson. It's in a similar vein to Shadow of Perseus by Claire Haywood. Hercules unpacked by the people who knew him best. I'm interested to see how she gives him nuance and where she falls on is he a good guy or an asshole or somewhere in between. What all this lot have in common so far is the fact that they suffer for others. It's not all about ego or glory or fucking mortals up and walking away. They actually help or at least choose not to hinder. I mean, the rest of the male titans, for instance, it's all childy in an castration. I appreciate the cosmic symbology of the divine masculine in the energy of Uranus, Kronos, Hyperion. It's all about solar energy, action, progress. It's not what they represent that irks me. It's how they treat women that sucks. Though the Titans aren't half as bad as those who came after them. Zeus, Ares, we all know what I think of Apollo. Just the worst. However... There are a few other gods I like, and you all know who I'm going to be gushing over at every opportunity. Don't worry, there's going to be plenty of big D worship to come. But first, here's Lorna's lists of gods what I like. In at number three, he may not be aesthetically hot, but he's the hottest ticket in terms of temperature. He's one sweaty, crafty geezer. It's the god of the forge. It's Hephaestus. Hephaestus, another suffering god. And don't get me wrong, my prerequisite for men in Greek mythology being decent isn't that they suffer terribly and sometimes die for humankind, but it is something of a theme in this episode, and it certainly helps their likability in an otherwise desolate landscape of shitty gods. I like Hephaestus because right from the off, he's up against it, and he doesn't let it get him down. Whichever origin myth you read, he always gets rejected and flung off Olympus by his mother and sometimes Zeus, not because he's done anything bad like stolen fire, No, his crime is being ugly, mangled, deformed, not stunningly beautiful like everyone else. And for that, he is cast out from the gods before he's even had a chance to prove himself. Does he go raging around Greece, punishing mortals for his bad luck and his mummy and daddy were mean to me issues like most of the other hot-headed idiot men in Greek mythology? No, he gets taken in by Thetis, mother of Achilles. I'll be back for you later, Achilles, and no, not to big you up and you know darn well why. 
Hephaestus is treated kindly, he's nurtured, he learns some serious skills and he decides to make his way back to Olympus and show these skills off and he makes himself indispensable to the gods who underestimated him from day one. Every mystical or inspiring object you can think of in Greek mythology was made by the peace-loving Zen master craft god who spends all day over a blazing hot fire. He makes Achilles' armour and in a master stroke of genius, he makes his mum a golden throne that traps her inside it and only he can get her out. Take that, mum. What do I want for getting you out of this chair I've trapped you in because you threw me off a frickin' mountain? Oh, nothing really. Just the goddess of love as my wife. Boom. Good for you, man. He wasn't going to get Aphrodite any other way, and it's not like he treats her mean. He clearly adores her, though this doesn't stop him from trapping her and Ares in a golden net of his own making while they're, you know, going at it, so all the other gods can ogle and laugh. There's a really lovely poem by Nikita Gill in Great Goddesses called Hephaestus's Tale. Here's a quote. He wore his kindness better than he wore his godhood and never once raised his voice at her. Somewhere along the way, she started to notice the soft things about him. I love that, that he's such an unassuming, chilled out master craftsman, making her beautiful things and never dragging her back to the marriage bed by her hair, that she starts to love him like for real. His oracle card message is, creation has its own consciousness. You must be willing to craft in service to the creation's needs rather than your own. And that's the two words that come to mind with this guy, craft and service. Without his craft and service to Olympus, they're mostly just a bunch of layabout egomaniacs who don't contribute anything to humanity. Never mind what he gets up to with those lady robots he made out of gold while his wife's out riding Adonis. He's a good egg. He's even got his own retelling novel by Helen Steedman. Anyone read it? If so, do let me know what you think. It's on my to-read list, naturally. In at number two, he's tricksy. He's mischievous. Don't leave him alone with your cattle because they'll be gone by the morning. Yes, it's everyone's favourite psychopomp. I love that word. It's Hermes, the messenger god, the god of travellers, the god of hospitality, language, thievery and cattle. His first act after popping out his mum being to steal Apollo's cattle. You've got to love a cheeky god whose first act in this world is to actively piss off that arsehole. Nice one, Hermes. He does display the usual problematic behaviour towards women, but ultimately, I like that his symbology, his function, is so wrapped up in assisting humans in a way a lot of the other gods are distant from them. He helps them discover the world. He's the god of their articulating of it. He's all about interpersonal relations. You'd want him on your team in the office. He's by no means on our side the same way that gods like Prometheus are, but like Artemis, like Dionysus, there you go, more to come later on him, obvs. He's a mortal-focused god whose gifts are less about stomping around being the big I am and more about the murkier underbelly of human treachery and cunning and messiness and the usefulness of intelligence And like Persephone, he walks between the underworld and the earth and heavens. He's our guide through the valley of death. I can imagine I'd be a little less terrified of the underworld if a mischievous raconteur like Hermes was showing me around. He's quite Loki-ish, and every time I think of Loki, I think of Tom Hiddleston. So therefore, in a nice feedback loop, every time I think of Hermes, I think of Hiddles. Oh, Hiddles. Anywho, in at number one, 
He's everyone's favourite chubby baby slash hot young androgynous man who I personally would cast as Timothy Chalamet in his origin movie. It's Eros, god of desire, son of Aphrodite. Who's the daddy? It's a bit of a mystery. It always is with her. She gets around. Eros, arrows of love. Once he shot you, that's it. You're done for. Resistance is futile. I like Eros for the same reason I like Aphrodite. No one is immune to the power of love, even the posturing gods. What does Eros do when Apollo turns up on his turf and starts taking the piss in the form of my dick's bigger than your dick, look at your flimsy arrows mockery? He shoots him with one of those arrows, so he falls in love with the nymph Daphne. And because love is cruel and Eros is sneaky and has yet to experience the consequences of love for himself, he shoots Daphne with a different arrow, so she is repelled by Apollo. It's an unrequited love disaster fest. Apollo's real pissed off. It's fun. It makes me happy. So moral of the story, don't piss off Eros, because regardless of what he's packing in the pants department, his arrows are big and shiny and sharp, and he will mess you up. Then what happens? He shoots the mortal Psyche because his mum's all jealous that Psyche has been hailed as the new Aphrodite, and he stupidly pricks himself on his own arrow. Or was it a subconscious desire to fall in love for himself, I wonder? Did he do it on purpose? He falls in love with Psyche. Now he knows how it feels, the blissful agony, the awful poetry. And after a rather unconventional courtship, where he whisks her to his palace and woos her, even though she can't see him because he stays invisible because he's scared of his mum, They fall in genuine love and his love redeems him. It makes a man of him. He helps Psyche pass some ridiculous no one will ever be good enough for my son tests that Aphrodite sets for her. And once she's proved herself worthy, they have one of those rare things in Greek mythology, a well-matched coupling of equals, a happy ending, a cute baby, oh bless. He's an actual grown-up man about love. He's the cynic who gets romantic. He's hot. I want him. Luna McNamara's Psyche and Eros is a refreshingly fluffy yarn that gives you Eros's perspective as well as Psyche's. And I'm not going to lie, I totally fancied her version of him as well. I hope they make a film of it. I hope they cast Timothy Chalamet. He's going to look great in a flimsy toga and wings. Make this happen, internet. So I know we've mentioned some demigods. Let's move on to the mortal heroes. And hero is a loaded word. The heroes that are revered in Greek mythology are, in my opinion, and the opinion of many female authors writing in this genre, not remotely heroic, to be honest, often causing the people around them more harm than good. For centuries, the world has revered this bunch of child-murdering, city-crushing, chest-beating rapists as the epitome of masculinity. These men are not to be applauded for sacrificing their daughters, enslaving women as their sex objects, needlessly killing thousands of people for their own ambition. I mean, what is the actual point of Bellerophon? Who? you might well be asking. Exactly. He's just another bragging twat who gets ideas above his station. Let's not waste our time with him. Even Odysseus, he of the cunning wiles, though he may be more intelligent and respectful of women than the rest of them, is nevertheless responsible for a lot of broken hearts and dead girls. And in a way, the fact that he knows better than the idiots around him, but that he facilitates their madness all the same, kind of makes him worse, I think. But there are some heroes I do actually have time for, and they have their problematic moments too, 
They're all steeped in the toxic masculinity of their culture. There's no getting away from that. But what I am trying to do here is pick out the best of a bad bunch. First up, a few mortal men that aren't heroes necessarily, but nevertheless do heroic things, or at least, as is the case with our next guy, don't add to the problem. I like Tiresias, the blind prophet. I like him because he's one of the few mortals in Greek mythology who has experienced life as both a woman and a man. After he was cursed because he watched some snakes going at it. And there's a lesson in that for all of us. Don't watch snakes shagging people. They're just not okay with it, okay? When Tiresias is asked to judge who's right between Hera and Zeus as to who enjoys a bit of Netflix and chill more, men or women, because Tiresias has this unique perspective, he says women to side with Zeus and Hera is infuriated, which definitely shows up the fundamental influence of patriarchy at this time. It's a shame he sides with Zeus, but again, he's smart. He's between a rock and a hard place and he knows at the end of the day what Zeus says is so, is so. He's just trying to get through the day. He opens Oedipus's eyes to the cause of the plague in Thebes. It's you accidentally shagging your mum and killing your dad, mate. Sorry, self-fulfilling prophecy and all that. He sees the danger in rejecting the worship of... Yeah, here we go again. I can't help it. I'm in deep. Dionysus, and implores the foolish men of Thebes to fall in line and get crazy. I mean, I'm all over that. Why would you not want to dress up and get drunk and worship the big D? Very wise, T-Man, very wise. He can see the bigger picture through his blindness, and no one wants to hear it. No one wants to hear the truth, but it is the only thing that can heal them. He's, again, carrying a heavy burden and he doesn't go around manipulating people with it for his own ends. He gives them the best advice he can, knowing he'll only get laughed at or dismissed and could be in real danger from it. And he never says, Told you so, didn't I, foolish, dismembered Pentheus? K. Tempest's Hold Your Own poetry collection is based on the myths of Tiresias and explores them through a modern lens, touching on gender, sex and the divides in society. Great book. And also, while we're talking about K. Tempest, they also explore the ancient myths in the modern world in brand new ancients. And I've got another K. Tempest recommendation for you later. Let's move on to Daedalus. Another master craftsman, the great inventor, the man who invented wonders that were used for questionable and horrific things, unfortunately, but wonders nonetheless. He designs the great sprawling labyrinth under the palace of King Midas, the structure that houses the Minotaur, the half-man, half-bull monster birthed by Pasiphae. How did this bull child come to be? Because Daedalus also invented a mechanical bull on Pasiphae's orders so that she could work through her bull fetish, let's say, because she was in fact under a spell because her arrogant husband Midas angered a god. The usual story. So he's in the unfortunate position of having a brilliant mind, a unique vision, but being at the mercy of a tyrant. And in attempting to escape this, he makes himself and his son Icarus wings so they can escape the tower that Midas has trapped them in because he doesn't want anyone else to benefit from Daedalus' genius. And this leads us to another tragic tale because, of course, Icarus doesn't follow his dad's advice. So enamoured is he of his dad's wondrous gift of wings, he flies too close to the sun, the wax in the wings melts, he plummets to his death and all his dad can do is watch. And even when he escapes, Midas still hounds him. He did his best under horrible circumstances. What could he have achieved if he'd had a different patron or patroness? So, 
Now we come to the big event in the breeding of Greek mythology heroes, the Trojan War. A chance for all the meatheads to strut their stuff. But who are the real heroes of Troy? Because it's not Agamemnon, it ain't Ajax or Paris or Menelaus. And it's definitely, and I know this might sound controversial, it's definitely not Achilles. Achilles, he of the golden hair and fighty prowess, has one redeeming feature. His obvious love for Patroclus. I have time for Patroclus. It's a shame the object of his adoration is Achilles, but nevertheless, he is the only person who humanises this otherwise remorseless killing machine. This is the crux of Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller. We see Achilles through the eyes of a man who loves him and he is loved back. And Patroclus isn't perfect either. He has a murky past, but Achilles draws him out and they fall in love. Unlike the euphemistic references in the classical texts that allude to something going on between them, but never say it outright, she goes there. They are lovers, they are romantically involved, and it shapes everything they do. Check out the Goddess Project's Gay Gods of Greece podcast episode for a deep dive into this. Patroclus is the only one out of all the Greeks who seems to be kind to women. He empathises with their plight. In the Iliad, one of the few things Briseis, Achilles' war prize, actually gets to say is when she's at Patroclus' funeral, she says, he was always kind to me. If Patroclus didn't take it upon himself to wear Achilles' armour, lead his men back into battle after Achilles gets a bee in his bonnet because Agamemnon has stolen his sex toy, who knows how long the Trojan War would have continued on for. He knows he can't fight as well as Achilles. He knows he's going to his death. He loves Achilles, but he cares for all these other people, these strangers, affected by this stalemate more. He sacrifices himself for a higher purpose than to save his Achilles. He can see how Achilles' behaviour affects the masses and acts accordingly, knowing that there's more at stake here than one man's pride. I think somehow he knows his death at the hands of the Trojans is the only thing that will get Achilles back in the game and that this shit show will never be over for any of them until that happens. Because Achilles is so heartbroken over Patroclus' death, he does indeed get back in the game and it accelerates the end of the war. Because of Achilles' uncontrollable grief, the true hero of the Trojan War, in my opinion, has a horrific and tragic end that heralds the end for the Trojans. Hector, Prince of Troy, the eldest son, the all-round good guy who's doing his best very much up against it, with every Greek in the world on his doorstep armed to the teeth. Hector is still defined by and trapped in the stereotypical toxic masculinity of the time, he can't help it, but he's not the one who stole another man's wife. Yet, he must take the flack for his vain pretty boy brother because Paris is too busy arranging his clothes and shagging to be bothered with war. He's also kind to Helen. He never blames her. He never drags her back to Menelaus either, which is a shame. But nevertheless, he seems to see her loneliness when it's obvious the relationship between her and Paris is souring. Hector doesn't want a war, but war is there at his gates and he can only do what must be done. There's this bittersweet moment where he's on the battlements with his wife Andromache and she's begging him not to fight because they both know that as soon as he realised he'd killed Patroclus, thinking it was Achilles, that he was a dead man walking. And there's this lovely moment where he has to take his helmet off because it scares his little baby son and they laugh about it. And of course, he gives her the man's gotta do what a man's gotta do speech and he goes and faces off with Achilles and he gets killed. Even after he's dead, Achilles subjects Hector's body to humiliation, the ultimate insult to his enemies. What is the big deal with Achilles? Seriously, this is no way to behave. I don't care how famous you are, how much you loved your boyfriend. 
Grow the fuck up. Know a true hero when you see one. Can we all just get over Achilles, please? The guy is toxic. Just a little throwback to the Atalanta episode. I've also got time for Meliga, the man who puts a woman's rightful heroism before the pride of his men and it costs him his life. And here's one more forgotten hero from the Trojan War that I want to big up. Philoctetes, the hero who never got to Troy with the rest of the Greeks because he was bitten by a snake on the way. And because the agony and the smell were a drag for the rest of them, Odysseus, what a great guy, leaves him on an island to rot and they all forget about him for about 10 years until a rather satisfying prophecy comes that they can only win the war with the magic bow of Hercules. Who's got this bow? You guessed it. But when Odysseus goes back to find Philoctetes, he doesn't full-on fall on his knees and beg forgiveness for leaving him on an island in pain for a decade. No, this is Odysseus. He proceeds to lie and manipulate him and when he is finally told the truth, he quite rightly refuses to go help them until Hercules comes down from Olympus and persuades him that if he does this, his hurt will be healed. He changes his mind and he goes along and that's a truly heroic act because he was well within his rights to burn the bow, tell the Greeks to go fuck themselves, fling himself off a cliff and leave them all to rot. Like Chiron and Prometheus, his suffering defines his actions towards others and he chooses to be altruistic when he could just be a selfish git like the rest of them. He deserves to have his constant pain healed when everyone around him inflicts pain on others for their own glory and excuse it with half-hearted ideas about honour. Philoctetes puts his pride, his justified vengeance aside and helps those who screwed him over because he knows there are real victims to this war, even more unfortunate than him. Kay Tempest did an amazing adaptation of Philoctetes at the National Theatre with an all-female cast that really pushes the theme of the horrors of war, the psychological damage to soldiers and makes some really interesting parallels about the way this country treats its veterans. I'll put a link to watch this show online in the show notes. Great show. So there we go. The men, gods and titans I actually have time for because in varying ways they have time for those less fortunate than themselves. They contribute to the greater good, not necessarily for their own glory. They are quietly rebellious. They are humbled. They are nice blokes I'd go down the pub with. Okay, I'm going to keep this brief as we wrap up because it's not like you haven't heard this before. My favourite god, mortal, man in the whole of Greek mythology is, as you know by now, Dionysus, for all the reasons above and more. Right from his tragic and bloody birth, he's different. He is a rebel god who, after swanning into Olympus, swans back out again and roams the world teaching mortals how to get drunk, get dark and wild and make theatre. He respects women. He champions the downtrodden. He is a god for outsiders, for the other, for those whose society disregards. He dies twice and is resurrected. He is a suffering wise god who has gone to the darkest depths and still retains an air of revelry and curiosity. He doesn't quite belong in the pantheon. He feels like he is ours, yet he remains untouchable and mysterious and dangerous. You don't want to get on the wrong side of him. But he has many sides. He's complex. He's complicated. He's seen shit, man. Some real messed up shit. Here's some links to Dionysus' adoration that I'll think you'll appreciate. Definitely check out Let's Talk About Myths Baby podcast episode Dionysus is Everyone and Everything Queer Theory. What's the link between Dionysus and Harry Styles, you may wonder? Listen and wonder no more. 
Also check out the Ariadne and Dionysus episode on the Goddess Project podcast, exploring their status as a Greek mythology power couple. And if you like a bit of Ariadne and Dionysus with an intelligent erotic bent, who wouldn't? I'm certainly loving it. Check out Zenobia Neal's Ariadne Unraveled, where we meet a badass priestess Ariadne who literally has Dionysus on his knees. I've just got to a bit where he meets the Minotaur and Asterion full on flashes him his tackle and I'm wondering if it's going to get a bit kinky. Who knows? I'll let you know when I've read it. Next month, we're keeping this Dionysus adoration theme up. I totally ended with him on purpose because there's more to come and I'm so not done. And I'm finally going to tell you who my favourite goddess is. Who have I not mentioned yet and how does she relate to Dionysus? Something to keep you guessing until next time. Thanks so much for listening. Feel free to like, subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can find me under Lorna Meehan or Rebel Heroines Podcast. If you'd like to get in touch, send me any pre-recorded poetry or drama on theme, please email me at lornaemeehan at gmail.com. I've got a Twitter, rebel underscore heroines. Please share with anyone who might be interested and I'll be back next month.